issue that we're discussing tonight. My name is Francesca Rattray. I'm the CEO of the YWCA. I want to begin with our mission, which is to empower women and eliminate racism. We, all of our programs over the next few years will be aligning behind that mission. We've been working mostly as a community center, which serves a very important need in this community, but we understand that working to change the system of racism and a, an oppressive system against women is what we need to do. So we're part of the YWCA USA, which oversees a network of 200 associations. Nationally, the YWCA has been working on the issue of violence against women, and each year celebrates or commemorates the, a week without violence. Last year, as part of a week without violence, the Biden Foundation, in partnership with the uh, YWCA USA Network, came down here and interviewed our own teams about intimate partner violence and other issues. So this is sort of a picking up of, of what happened last year. Locally, we address the root causes and work to empower women through our self-esteem building program, so as Be Cadetta, and also educating boys about their role in empowering women and, and being, taking care of women and, and treating them with respect. As a mom of two boys, this is very important to me in, in modeling good behavior to, to boys. So over the next few years, we are looking to expand those programs for, uh, uh, for young women to build self-esteem and to build financial literacy so that they can leave relationships if it gets to the point that it is abusive, and also building programs that educate boys and girls. So with that, I want to thank all of my staff who made this evening possible, especially Lily Kasura, who I'm going to turn it over to right now. Thank you again for coming. For being here. We're just very grateful to be able to have this conversation about teen dating violence and have it in English and Spanish thanks to the city of San Antonio providing simultaneous translation. That's them over there. And so for our presenters to just be conscious of not reading very fast because there's a lot more Spanish to pack in <laughs> in the translation. And because teen dating violence is a difficult topic and there's trauma associated with it. The reality is that as you hear the presentation tonight, not that there is anything that necessarily looks obviously triggering about it, but because of trauma, we sometimes hear things and think, oh my goodness, I have, I too have experienced that. And so what we wanted to do, we put index cards on every chair. And um, if you feel like you have a question you want to ask, but you want to ask it in private, or if you have a situation you want to get some advice on, put some information to contact you on it and drop it off in a basket up here at the end. And we'll make sure to take it um, seriously and get it to someone who can get back to you with some advice. So the purpose of tonight really is education. Uh, survivors have amazing stories to tell. There's a lot of tragedy too that we've witnessed in this situation, even in our own YWCA here, we had our receptionist who was murdered for domestic violence several years ago, and it's still traumatic to staff who remember the family. So we're just very glad you're here, but our purpose tonight very much is to educate about what teen dating violence is and isn't. It's connected to adult domestic violence, but it's also its own experience. So we're hoping that by the end of tonight's three presentations, We'll have a question and answer session, and our goal is that people walk away with a more holistic, comprehensive understanding of what this very important topic is that's so poorly understood in our community, and that can help begin the healing process on this. So thank you for your time, and I'm going to introduce Jenny Hickson, who is the point person for Metro Health in the city of San Antonio as the violence prevention Manager, violence prevention manager. That's a heck of a title. So, thank you so much. Um, good evening, and I think I'm really um, honored that Lily asked me to be here because I just started in this role. It's 
a new goal for the City of San Antonio this year. Um, that's part of our general expansion in a commitment to working on domestic violence and intimate partner violence. So one of the tasks that I've been working on over the last few months is doing a community-wide assessment of how we can put together a comprehensive plan to address domestic violence, including teen dating violence, for San Antonio. And in doing that assessment, I talked to a lot of people. I talked to several of you in this room as a part of that assessment. And there were two things that almost every person that I spoke to said. The first thing was that we needed more information in the community about how to get help, about the resources that were out there, and about what domestic partner and intimate partner violence looked like. And the second thing was that we needed youth programming. That that was something that everyone saw as a big need that students in schools starting very young needed to get more information about what healthy relationships and what dating violence looked like before they got into their first relationship. From a public health perspective, this makes a lot of sense. My background is maternal and child health, which is an explicitly intergenerational understanding of the way that health works. And I think we all also understand that violence is an issue that is oftentimes intergenerational and it starts early and it continues on. So teen dating violence is the place where if we can intervene and support kids in developing healthy relationship skills in their first relationship, we can really change that trajectory for our whole community. So I'm so glad that you're all here tonight and um, I brought my son here too as well. Um, I think it's a really important issue for all of us. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. And I just wanted to introduce tonight's panelists because you really are in for a treat. So they're not sitting in the same order as they were on the flyer. <laughs> but this is Dr. Heidi Rueda in the middle. She's a recently tenured professor in the social work department at UTSA. And one of her research specialties is teen dating violence with us Hispanic population, Hispanic youth. So very excited about what you're going to share. Patricia Castillo, we all know, fabulous social worker, has literally been working in this field since 1979 in San Antonio. She doesn't look it, which is great. But she's going to be able to talk about the cultural links, healthy identity formation, and where this fits into what we see as adult domestic violence. So very excited to have everyone here. And this is Kimberly Berry, who works at the YWCA as the Mi Carrera coordinator, formerly of the Rape Crisis Center, and she has a really fantastic presentation that she's presented to teens before, and also to educators at Region 20. And I think we're really ahead of the curve with this evening tonight, and I'm very excited about what they're going to share. The format is they're each going to get up and teach their module, and then they're going to sit down, the next person's going to start, and at the end we're going to have questions and answers. And again, if there's something you want to talk about but keep it private, feel free to just fill out a card and get it to us, and we'll take it seriously. So again, thank you so much, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Rueda. Great, thank you, Lily. I do have a PowerPoint over here, so I'm going to be walking around a bit. Hopefully I'll get to the end in a second. Um, I'm very honored to be here, and I just do want to thank Lily and Clara for inviting us and for putting us really meaningful presentation together. Estoy feliz que estén aquí con nosotros para discutir este asunto tan importante en la comunidad. So, dating violence. It's a heavy topic potentially, um, but a lot of my presentation tonight is also going to focus on um, resiliency, strengths, and healthy dating, what healthy relationships can look like, and how important they are for youth development. I dated in high school. I had a, a very long-term relationship. Um, started dating at 15 and we um, ended it at age 21 after a lot of what we call churning, meaning um, you know, getting back together, leaving the relationship, getting back together. Um, and this, this relationship was very impactful in my life. It helped me to form my identity. Um, it helped me to try on new roles influence the peer groups that I was part of. Um, so one thing that I think I also want us to all take away from tonight is just the importance of relationships um, during adolescence. So let's get started with the presentation. 
Okay, so I mentioned that I started dating at 15, um, but that's not atypical. Actually, most teens date. The statistic is really high. Nearly 70% of teens are involved in some sort of romantic or intimate experiences. Um, that's within the past year. So how this sort of evolves is that teens um, go out in mixed sex groups during middle school. Um, they start coming together after having been apart in terms of gender all through elementary school. You may be aware of, you know, boys and girls calling each other names, not wanting anything to do with the other sex, and then around middle school start to hang out in mixed sex groups, and then um, dyads start to form, meaning that coupling starts to happen. Um, today, when we think about adolescent dating, we also need to consider online interactions. So peers are a huge part of dating, and that's one thing that really differentiates it from later um, later relationships is the influence that peers have um, on their relationship, how involved they are, and how complicated it's become with social media. Um, so for example, someone you know posting a picture with friends, um, liking that picture, and very easily someone can comment on that, jealousy can happen, um, comments going back and forth, um, in terms of, you know, through Facebook, through texting, through many other social media outlets. I mean, teens are usually ahead of us, adults, but they, they find a way to, to talk. Um, so we want to think about that. And also developmentally, teens are forming their identities. Um, so they're looking for more autonomy from parents. They don't spend as much time at home. They don't spend as much time with their families. Um, but they also have intimacy goals. So they're trying to balance their new autonomy and you know, being granted more privileges and more time with friends and potentially with romantic partners um, with, with the desire for a partnership, for something that's real and meaningful. Um, these first romantic experiences, we know from research, actually do shape um, the individual across um, into beyond adole adolescence, excuse me, into early adulthood. Um, and they're trying out new roles, and when I say that, that's part of the identity formation. So today, hookups and friends with benefits and committed partnerships, um, teens have all different ways of, of dating and of naming their, their types of relationships. Um, again, I mentioned my relationships. Some relationships are really long-term and long-lasting. Long when you talk to teens, especially when you give them a survey where they feel like they can answer confidentially, they will tell you that they're very committed to their relationships, that they mean a lot to them. Um, these aren't you know, puppy love, as it's often been stigmatized. Um, and teens want to know more about how to have healthy relationships. So I'm really excited to see some teens here tonight in the audience. Um, if you don't mind, could you raise your hand and just, um, if you are a parent of a teen, can you let me know? I'm curious who's in the audience. Okay, we have quite a few parents of teens, great. Um, who here works with teens professionally? Maybe in social work or counseling or other fields? Okay, great. And who here is a teen and is interested in learning more about this topic? Or was maybe <laughs> dragged here by parents? <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'm happy that y'all are here. I think there's something in this presentation for all of us because relationship challenges don't just go away after learning a little bit about them during adolescence. But something very unique about the adolescent brain is that it's actually in a growth spurt that's very important. So reaching teens is the perfect time because their brains are flexible. They can learn and they can integrate new behaviors, new ways of thinking easier than we can later in life. One thing that we, that we do need to keep in mind though is that the brain isn't fully developed yet. And what this means for teen relationships is that emotions are heavy. They weigh in a lot because the part of the brain that's responsible for rational thinking and weighing emotions with with our rational thinking and decision making, um, that's just not fully developed yet. So emotions are very strong and especially when we look at emotions like jealousy, um, you know, thinking that a partner may be cheating, peer involvement, you know, getting left out, isolation, these are very real and very impacting emotions for you. Um, this also contributes to making breakups extremely difficult. Okay, and a lot, a lot of what I'm saying right now is just normative, right? It's for, for teens who are going through any type of relationship, and if there is a breakup, 
um, that can be really devastating, and it's something that contributes to depression and suicidality in many teens, um, so it's something to be taken seriously. When, when we get into talking about um, some violence aspects too, it's a risk factor for um, potential, potentially more abuse um, or stalking, um, depending on the context of the situation. Okay. And the, common, the most common topics in terms of conflict are jealousy and cheating. Um, we can see that that's part of adolescent development. They're in school all day with their partner and so many other teens, right? So that's a really unique context. Um, they might see their boyfriend in the hallway walking with another girl. What does that mean? What does that mean to the teen? What kinds of emotions are solicited by that? Okay, so it's very common for teens to have some conflict, to have some discussion around things that are bothering them in the relationship. I'm going to go over now, though, what contributes to um, abuse, what we would call abuse. I'm also going to talk about conflict here in a minute and talk about communication um, because there is a little bit of a gray area sometimes. But these are these are characteristics that we know are red flags for, for abusive relationships. Um, slapping, hitting, shoving, choking, any kind of physical violence like that. Hair pulling and throwing things is common as well. Yelling, name calling, or put downs. Probably that's the communication aspect and contributes um, or could be even defined really as emotional abuse or psychological abuse. So far we have physical, also emotional or psychological, um, gossiping about a dating partner. That's a type of violence that we study uniquely in adolescence as relationship violence, trying to hurt someone's reputation during a time when reputation is so important. Excessively jealous and possessive controlling how a dating partner dresses or acts, okay? Ignoring or giving someone the silent treatment, unwanted or pressured touching or sexual activity. Okay, there's a long list, but these are some of the um, behaviors we should look for. It's also important to know what a healthy relationship looks like and to, um, again, realize that these relationships are also common in adolescence and that relationships typically aren't defined by either unhealthy or healthy, right? That they have the characteristics of both, which is why it's really complex to be um, a teen in a relationship, especially when conflict exists and can escalate, um, or when there's violence. So some traits of a healthy relationship are assertiveness, understanding, trust. Trust is a big one for teenagers. Um, fighting fair, which I'll talk about here in a second. Problem solving, negotiation, and compromise. Anger control is also something that we see a lot in the research contributing to um, escalating arguments um, and being a role model. Okay, what do I mean by fighting fair? And when I say this, this talk is for everyone, I really do mean that. I don't think that you know there's a perfect couple in the room or, or really in the, in the globe, across the globe, right? So we're always learning um, and we're, we're trying to love our partner better, essentially. So this is speaking calmly and warmly. Okay, a lot of times arguments can start with um, what we call harsh startup, which is straight in with um, an insult or what somebody's not doing right, something that we're upset about, um, but bringing things to light in a calm and respectful manner. It helps when we take time to relax. We want to be specific with one issue instead of what we call dumping, which is bringing a whole bunch of issues to the, the uh, to the conversation. We want to focus on solutions, okay? Compromise is which solutions. And especially in teens, this is something that um, we really want to work with teens on and value is the building of their friendships and considering friendships as the really the building block for romantic relationships. And we know this from both marital research and research with teens that we want much more positivity in the relationship than negativity. The golden rule is five times as much positive interaction as negative. Okay. Don't talk about an issue while you are very emotionally upset. That's a huge, huge issue. I said don't dump, bring up old issues, focus on who is to blame, or use sarcastic or insulting remarks, threats, or other forms of violence. Okay, and I bring these up in the context of some of my research. Um, I did a study recently where we recruited teenage couples, Mexican-American couples, to be videotaped discussing areas of conflict in their relationship. So they got to decide what are the top two areas of conflict, um, what do you fight about essentially, and then seven minutes on camera, one teen 
seven minutes on camera and the other teens issue, right? They, they, they spoke 14 minutes about their conflict. And um, when we analyzed that data in terms of what they were talking about in the context and how they were towards each other in terms of you know, verbal aggression, um, poking someone's ear using the pencil on the table, um, boundary crossing, um, the biggest thing that we saw, and we were able to link this then to couples that also answered that they had unhealthy relationship dynamics and, and, and violence in many cases, um, using sarcastic or insulting remarks, okay, calling each other names, um, giving each other the silent treatment, that those behaviors were evident even in a videotaped interaction. Um, you might think that they would be themselves on video, but actually we have been there a minute, and um, I was knocking on the door and saying, okay, your time's up, and they, they were still talking, <laughs> still working things out. Um, so, if you're a practitioner, and you have a team that comes to you, or a parent, but especially right now, I think it's so important to be thinking about um, screening for types of violence. Because right now I'm talking a lot about communication, and that's because that's um, part of situational violence, is the term that we use in research. Situational, meaning that it's not necessarily patterned control, um, pattern types of fear. We are going to talk about that a lot tonight, so that's partly why I'm bringing this to the forefront. Um, what we see here, though, are risk factors that a teen, an individual, brings to the relationship, plus relationship conflict and stress. This is the formula for what can happen in situational violence, which is essentially out of control fights. Okay, these are often mutual, which is a, um, I think, a, a something that a lot of um, individuals don't understand about adolescent dating violence and how it can be different is that both teens often are going at each other, um, and you know, in physical ways with emotional threats, with emotional abuse. Um, accusations, purposefully making a partner jealous, negative tone. Um, so we see this with both boys and girls um, and, and other couple types. So this is escalating anger. I'm sure you can picture this in your mind. Maybe you have some experience with this in a relationship um, where teens don't have the communication skills and the emotional regulation to be able to handle the, the, the conflict in a respectful way or to exit the, the conversation and take a time out that they need to take. Um, technology can contribute to this. And interestingly, when we look at research, there does tend to be a power imbalance with situational violence, often favoring females. So more research is needed on that, but I'm just gonna leave it <coughs> for now. Um, because this type of violence is distinct from, again, what we'll be talking about after this. Um, again, here, emotional violence is the strongest predictor of physical violence, meaning it goes from verbal to physical, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example, because I think this is so telling, um, of two, this is two individuals who were in the lab, so they were being recorded, a couple, Javier, I'm using um, fake names, so that, of course, to protect their identity, um, age 17, born in Mexico, and Christina, age 17, born in the US, okay? But both identifying as Mexican-American, They'd been dating or going out for two years. Um, not a lot of teens even say going out anymore. It's hard to stay on top of the trends. Um, and their chosen conflict issues were jealousy and a partner avoiding talking about difficult issues. Okay, so here they are in the lab and they need to talk about it. Javier, he said, I try to talk to you and you just like hang up on me. How am I gonna try to talk to you if you're just gonna hang up on me? Christina says, well, you do the same thing. Javier says, why are you trying to flip it against me like that? We're just trying to like talk about it. Christina, see what I just did different right now? You do that to me all the time. Why are you trying to like, you're still doing it? So you can hear them kind of talking over each other. Christina, I know, but I'm just telling you. Javier, but I'm just like, Christina, I know, but I'm just telling you. You don't have to get pissed off. Javier, you don't have to get defensive. I'm not getting pissed off. Christina, I'm not getting defensive. I'm just telling you. Okay, so you can see how there wasn't, um, so there weren't solutions offered there, or mutual problem solving, it kind of just spun out into um, anger about the issue and an inability to, to make some progress on, on the issues. Okay, and again, that verbal aggression, when we could see that on the, on the camera, and then we also talked to teams quite a bit in their focus groups, 
and we did over 300 inter uh, surveys, excuse me, so we were able to look at all these data together and see how these types of interactions are predictive of violence in the relationship. Intimate terrorism, this is something different. This is really important to understand as a type of violence. Not that these two types of violence, situational and intimate terrorism, don't share overlap, because they certainly can, and they can start out as situational um, and become what we call intimate terrorism. But this is where one partner asserts control over the other, threats and intimidation, isolation. This, this is where we see typically one-sided, male-dominated relationships. There's a power differential there, um, and where the violence is directed towards females, okay? This often, also, it's contextualized by sexual control, more severe forms of violence, even life-threatening. Um, this is the type of violence that can escalate to homicide. And also, where breakups put the couple at risk for, future, for further abuse or stalking. So our female tries to leave or break up, um, and it actually can escalate and make things very scary. Okay, so I do think our other presenters are going to talk about that specific type of violence um, in their experiences. I'm going to continue to talk a little bit more about the adolescent um, dating relationships and dating violence in general. So of those 70% of teens that I mentioned who are dating, 8% um, had experienced physical violence. Okay, we don't know the context of that um, because this is a nationally representative survey, so we're looking at teens from all over the United States. Um, and we, but we know that oftentimes it's reciprocal when it's when it is situational. So most most of the time it is situational. About 70% of, of uh, violent episodes are within situational context. 11% um, of females have been forced to have sex. Sexual violence is, is a different, it's, it's its own thing, okay? When we look at sexual violence, typically that is um, male aggressor um, for, you know, forcing or really coercing a female to um, go further than she wants to sexually. It's, it's pretty sad that um, most, most of the time when females first have sex, it is under pressure, okay? Um, and again, many, many others are forced to do sexual things, all right? Emotional abuse is also really common. We see that um, anywhere from 50 to 80% of teens some form of emotional abuse. And again, that, that's um, that, that type of fighting um, that, that's really uh, reflective of poor communication skills. Okay, so what are the risks? What puts a teen at risk for experiencing dating violence? Well, the biggest one is exposure to violence. We see exposure to violence in our homes, we see it at school with our peers, and we see it in the community. Parent-child aggression, Okay, when parents and children are experiencing aggression, um, usually parent to child, um, that's why we want to um, think about how we're parenting. We want to um, we want to use what's called authoritative parenting, and it's kind and it's warm, but it also sets boundaries and monitors the teen, talks to the teen, um, is knows what's going on. Acceptance of violence is another huge predictor. Okay, when we're seeing violence all around us, it can be the norm. It can be just what's expected or what we see. Um, trait anger, meaning again, um, emotional escalation is often what contributes to situational violence. And when a person comes into a relationship and has um, anger is a really big part of what they're they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, that individual can can um, bring that to the relationship. Okay, poor anger management, poor communication. Also, there's some demographics that. LGBTQT youth are, are a higher risk, as are youth who um, have disabilities. Oftentimes, situational violence happens when teens are using drugs or alcohol, especially alcohol, okay? And within Hispanic culture, we do see that alcohol use is more permissible at earlier ages. So, um, you know, it's family barbecues, um, you know, boys especially getting together, and um, partaking of alcohol earlier is just more societally acceptable um, within that culture, but it's also highly normative um, across other, other ethnicities um, and, and um, demographic groups in the United States. Um, also, highly rigid traditional gender norms, okay? So traditional gender norms are fine. That doesn't necessarily predict any kind of violence, but when those, when those gender norms are so rigid, 
that um, the male has a certain role or has certain roles and the female has certain roles and there's not flexibility there, that can be a risk for violence, okay? More time in the United States. So teens who have just immigrated, they have less um, likelihood of experiencing violence in their romantic relationships. The longer they're here in the United States, the, the higher the risk gets. Um, and unplanned pregnancy, okay, is another risk for dating violence. All right, so what are some factors that help to buffer or protect you who may experience violence? Um, these are more fun to talk about. Adaptive machismo, this really is not what we typically think about when we think about machismo, okay? But there are adaptive and positive aspects of machismo that we can be fostering in our boys. Um, so there's, there's more and more research coming out around this, how boys are oftentimes problem solvers in the relationship. They're emotionally there for their girlfriend or their, their partner. Um, and that hasn't been, um, that hasn't received as much attention as the negative forms of machismo. So we want to encourage leadership with our um, boys and girls. We want to encourage goal setting. We want to encourage emotional intelligence, okay? Um, familism or familismo. Strong sense of ethnic identity to buffer the acculturation stressors or having moved to the United States. There's a lot of stress that comes along with that in many ways. Religi religiosity, and that's especially when um, it's personal to the youth, uh, a little different than kind of going to church twice a year or kind of getting dragged there. <laughs> but it can become internalized and become an important um, youth resiliency. Self-esteem and self-efficacy. Sports, after-school activities with peers. And it was mentioned earlier that you know, having more programming for youth, that can be a really big asset to teens and to the community. Okay, when they come to us, we want them to come to us, don't we? We want to be there and having these conversations so that we can prevent um, further abuse if it's already taking place or prevent um, abuse at all. But what we know is that most teens, 86% around maybe 90% talk to a friend. That's who they're gonna go talk to, okay? before they talk to an adult. And they have to perceive that the abuse is very strong or very severe or scared before they'll talk to an adult. But they know about each other's relationships. So I just wanna end my presentation with some tips for peers, for parents, and for um, practitioners, okay? So if you're a peer, if you're a teen, the important thing is to understand that, it's, um, that violence is never acceptable. Violence is never okay. We can learn to you know, resolve conflicts peacefully, and it does take work. Um, we want to say no to violence of all kinds. We want to encourage our friends to get help, okay? We want to be a peer mentor, so someone in the school, someone in our group that, that doesn't accept violence. We want to learn how to fight fair, which I've talked about tonight, okay? Learn to recognize the signs of abuse. We want to listen well, and seek help immediately, so on behalf of our friend, if there are safety issues, if we're concerned about um, intimate terrorism, that type of violence, where they could be hurt and we wouldn't want that to happen. Um, and you can ask your school also about starting a healthy relationships program for all teens. If you're a parent, teens want to know how to have healthy relationships, and they're looking to you, so talk to them often and model those good relationship skills for them. Set healthy parameters for teens' technology, meaning when can they use technology, how should they be using technology, and have those conversations. Understand that teens' goals, I think this is a big one, are often to stay in the relationship and to work it out, even if there has been violence. They, they care about their partners. These are meaningful relationships, just like adult relationships are. The same feelings, if you do a brain scan on a teen, the same parts of the brain are lighting up with strong emotion, connection, and wanting to commit to the partnership that we see in adults. Um, so understand that they want to work it out, even in violent relationships, okay? They say that they feel supported. They share intimate details of their lives with each other and are best friends. So get support and help. If you're in school, and this is personally my favorite one because I like to advocate for school-based programming because it's where we can meet all teens. It's where all the teens are, and we use the universal programming, meaning every teen gets some prevention services. Um, that's where we can we can find them. And earlier, the better. Teens are dating in middle school, right? 
So school counselors, nurses, social workers, y'all are at the front line. So if a team does close to get help, it's to one of y'all, okay? So you want to learn about the different context of violence and how to screen. What type of violence is happening here? Is this appropriate to teach communication skills and anger management? Um, or is this more of a situation where safety is an immediate threat? Um, and we always want to do safety planning. That's the first thing that we want to be thinking about with any teen in a violent situation. We want to stay with and support that teen through the whole process. Right? It's, it's not a one-time thing. It's not something where we give them a resource or we give them a flyer or we give them a talk. And this is so hard because we're so understaffed in schools. There might be one social worker for so many teens. Um, so we want to find ways as a community. And that's part of what we're here to do tonight is to come together around this and figure this out. How can we better stick with teens throughout the whole process? And be sure that everyone is trained in trauma-informed practices because many teens are are experiencing trauma, they have experienced trauma coming into the relationship, and that can have a huge impact um, that we want to be thinking about. How can we train everyone, even the janitors in our schools, right, the police in our schools, how to work in a way that is sensitive to trauma and that isn't punitive and just reinforces power and control over that team. Okay, I'll suggest a few programs that I know of that are evidence-based. Um, I'm doing some research right now, it's called the 4th R. That's a relationship program, and um, so far it has some really great outcomes in terms of preventing violence and also um, helping you to communicate and um, to, uh, uh, to prevent bullying as well as other forms of peer violence. Also, Love Notes and Relationship Smarts Plus, these are through the Dibble Institute, if you want to look those up, those are also evidence-based. Um, Schools. We do want to think about couples, groups, or individual counseling. Couples counseling is not always appropriate. Okay? We want to think about whether um, there are safety concerns or whether bringing the couple together can mask some of the issues going on. So individual counseling is recommended and group, you know, more for just having teams support one another and be able to um, talk about it more generally. This is one of my final plugs and it's advocacy for policy around um, teen dating violence prevention and intervention. Because 19 states out of 50 have a, um, a state mandate around what schools are supposed to be doing with teen dating violence, and Texas is one of those states. Our policy, and this is word for word, urges or requires, um, so you can see the ambiguity there, um, each school to have a teen dating violence policy. What's in a teen dating violence policy? It says how we're going to handle situations of violence. Are we going to have a plan for moving a child, or moving a teen out of the classroom, out of the school, so they don't have to be in the same context as their abusive partner? Okay. Um, this should be a policy that's available to parents in Spanish and in English that outlines what's happening at the school in terms of their are there programs going on in the school to, to um, work with teens around healthy relationships? So I did a study on this and surveyed all the school districts that I could get a hold of in San Antonio. So I was able to survey um, schools representing over 84,000 youth here in San Antonio and looked, looked at this policy. Do they have one? Is it posted online? Is it in Spanish? How accessible is it? And what does it say? Um, and sadly, we're not really doing a great job with that. It's very difficult to find a teen dating violence policy in any of the schools. And when there are teen dating violence policies, um, they, they're not very clear in terms of what's happening at the school. So teens, you know, talk to your school, talk to your uh, teachers, your social workers, and your principal and ask, well, what is our dating violence policy here? You know, that's one way that you can support your peers as well. Okay, so I'm going to end there. We have two other amazing presentations tonight, but you're welcome to contact me at my phone number here or my email anytime. So thank you so much for being a great audience. Well, that was a great presentation, Heidi. Thank you. So informative and so um, revealing in terms of everything that 
young people in our communities are facing and um, how unfortunately sometimes if we're not careful it puts um, young people in danger in dangerous situations especially if they don't know what um, the signs look like what the behaviors are indicators of what um, you know what kinds of things are really going to put somebody in a situation of danger um, I don't know if y'all noticed but our sheriff walked in Sheriff Javier Salazar thank you for coming sheriff and joining us the thing I appreciate about Sheriff Salazar is that he understands the intergenerational aspect of this type of behavior, which is something that I um, had the opportunity to witness and experience by way of being involved in this work since 1979. When I started doing this work, I was a little green social worker working at the Bear County uh, Women's Bar Association Clinic, and most of the women that came to the clinic to see lawyers were women who were in violent relationships, right? And then from there, I went to go work as a community organizer, and I would be knocking on people's doors in the east side where I was working. That was just, you know, my area. And, um, you know, every third door, somebody with a black eye would open the door, or a busted lip or a bruised cheek. And you know, me being the fisgona that I am, I would say, what happened to your face? You know? And, and they would tell me, well, you know, we had a little problem here last night, you know? And so I got to see how prevalent it was. And then from there, I went to work at the Battered Women's Shelter. And we need to quit calling it the Battered Women's Shelter, right? Because when you Google Battered, salen uh, fish sticks. So that's not a good, that's not a good uh, thing to be using when we're talking about women who are being abused, right? It's not, it's, it's, you know, it tends to, you know, make fun of it, right? And, and, and we're talking about serious things, right? People who are being abused. Uh, and Lily taught me that, and I'm very appreciative of that, Lily. And she opens my eyes to a lot of different things, and that's what we need. We need to be helping each other learn about these things, right? And um, so from there, I went to go work at the um, at the Battered Women's Shelter, I mean, at the shelter for women who are victims of violence. And um, I really learned a whole bunch of stuff there because the women who I was serving were my greatest teachers, right? Uh, and then I went to go work at um, the jail. I went to run the, the match program at the jail and that's a program for women inmates that um, if you go to classes, then you earn contact time with your kids. Uh, so I worked there a couple of years, and then I went to go work at SAPD, and guess what? When I got to SAPD and at the jail, I started running into the women and the daughters and the granddaughters of some of the people that I had worked with at the shelter. So I got to see the legacy of family violence, of relationship violence, where the kids were learning and repeating and modeling the same behaviors that they saw in their families of origin. And so, um, you know, that's why this issue is so important and so critical that if we don't recognize how this is, you know, can be a learned behavior that we pass on from generation to generation, then, you know, nunca vamos a acabar. We're never going to finish, right? We're never going to do something about this, right? We're not going to be able to make a dent, okay? And um, I think it's real important that in all of this also, just as um, Dr. Grueva said, we've got to look at how cultura plays a part in all of this, right? So I think of examples of cultura, like in my family, you know, she brought up the whole thing about familismo. Well, in my family, el familismo was very important, right? Like, you know, you had the, we had the hierarchy, right? With the father on top, 
right? And then the power came down this way, right, from my father. But honestly, in, family, in our form of familismo, my mom was la jefa, right? She was the boss, right? My mom was the boss, but she made my dad look like the boss all the time, right? And so, you know, ella le daba su lugar a mi papá, right? My dad would have his place on top of the hierarchy, and he looked like he was the boss, but really she's the one that ran everything, right? And so we believe in those kinds of structures, right? But in some structures, that is really authoritative. And it can turn into something abusive, and it can turn into something violent, right? When somebody has that position of power, where it's unchecked power, where it's unquestioned power, and then that behavior gets modeled and passed down to the boys and the girls in our families, right? And um, so I got to see both. I got to see my dad as the hardworking uh, man who loved us and who would give his life for us because we were his children. And I also got to see my mom who in her quiet, shy voice, you know, pretended like, you know, she was just the little wife when really she was la jefa, right? And so she ran everything. But still, it was the strong foundation de mi familia, right? That's what made up the strong foundation de mi familia. And um, unfortunately though, in some familismo, we pass on those negative behaviors, right? Where the children are the property of the, of the parents. And that's not good you know, when the children are the property of the parents, because then the parents might come from a mindset that they can do whatever they want with those kids, right? Because, you know, you've heard that saying, right? I brought you into this world, I'll take you out, right? Que feo, you know, that's, that's not a good thing, right? But, and it speaks to the whole thing about violence and how violence is allowed. And one of the things that we're trying to do also to start young with our young kids is to talk about how disciplining our children cannot involve hitting. Because there we're planting the seeds of violence. When we hit our children as a way of trying to teach them a lesson, we have to communicate, you know, because our words and the way we deliver our words is much more powerful and much more effective than slapping somebody because they did something wrong, right? And so um, we have a campaign called Love and Respect the Relationship. And it's about how parents raise children and whether or not, you know, we should be hitting our children. We already know from science, from studies, from research, from everywhere where we know that when children are hit by their parents, especially by their parents, it, especially at a very young age, you're affecting their brain development, right? And, and, it's, and it's a brain that becomes developed and trained by trauma, right? And we really have to look at those uh, approaches and rethink them for the sake of this next generation that's coming up. I mean, if we were to stop hitting our children, right now, all of us stopped hitting our children, we would create a whole other kind of generation that we've never known before. Because all of us have been raised with a lot of hitting, at least most of us, I would say. Because when I talk to people, everybody tells me, hey, my parents beat the crap out of me and I turned out okay. <laughs> and they say it with pride, right? A mi me yo estoy bien. And the truth is, you know, when you start scratching a little bit beyond the surface, you start finding out all the problems those people have, right? <laughs> you know? And, and people tell me, well, you know, your parents hit you and you turned out okay, Patricia? And I'm like, yeah, I did thousands of dollars of therapy. <laughs> Tenía que sanar las heridas, right? I had to heal myself, right? But what if we wouldn't have to even do that? We would be setting a tone and putting forth an example for our kids that would be completely different. 
completely different, right? Based on communication, based on relationship building, based on those assets of our history, right? And helping our children learn about themselves and learn who they are and learn their values and their traditions and their dreams and their beliefs about all kinds of things, right? About faith, about love, about you know relationships, about education, about you know get, being involved in your community. I mean, all of these things that you know we don't take the time to talk to our kids about, and then they don't even know what they are and who they are and what they care about, and then they go get involved in a relationship with somebody that they don't even know and they don't even know themselves. And then we're surprised at the result. We can't do that. We've got to teach our kids and help our kids discover themselves. Learn about themselves, right? Who they are, where they came from, what's their history, what's their, you know, what country is their family line from? You know, what was their great-grandparents' jobs and what were they about and what did they do and how did they accomplish that? And, you know, and, but we don't talk about any of them. Some kids don't even know what their mom's favorite color is. And if they don't even know what their mom's favorite color is, you know, then do they know their mom? And if they don't know their mom, how are they gonna know themselves? And so that's the kind of foundation we gotta be talking about in terms of our kids and what we want them to turn out to be like. And, and then, to hopefully fulfill our dreams of them having good, healthy, strong, productive relationships for themselves and their futures, right? And so we, I would just want to challenge us to really talk about how do we, you know, engage community to be engaged with their kids and teaching their kids and helping their kids discover themselves and who they are and forming their identity, right? Um, because otherwise, you know, um, we're gonna be fostering relationships that are based on ignorance and, and a lack of information and a lack of understanding of how relationships are supposed to work. And, um, you know, then really, you know, what we turn into is just a series of hookups, right? Just a bunch of hookups. Happening right, and you know maybe that works for somebody, but I think um, you know I I would like to see young people be involved in relationships that are about respect and communication and and mutual benefits and mutual love and um, you know getting to know each other and getting to you know live life together, right? Um, so what like I think about music. Think about music in terms of our cultura, right? Our culture. What are some things in music that we've seen that you know kids are listening to, and you're like, oh my God, no wonder the kids are so jacked up, right? <laughs> you know, when you think about the kind of music they listen to, right? And uh, I think it's terrible, right? I mean, in my day, we used to think about mariachi songs, right? Uh, and because we all worked at the shelter, on uh, all the women that I worked with at the shelter, and there was this one song that said, Meteme tres balazos en la frente, pero no me dejes. Right? <laughs> you know? And that translates into, you know, you can shoot me in my head three times, but please just don't abandon me. Don't leave me. Right? And, and those are the kinds of songs, you know, that we would sing. And that we would, you know, echar gritos to, ha, 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 ha. Right? And, you know? drinking some beers with our buddies and enjoying ourselves, right? Singing those horrible songs, right? Well, it's just as bad now, right? And we gotta think about the role of cultura and how it shapes our kids and how it makes us, you know, our kids think about themselves and think about the people around them. And that's just one thing, right? Um, and so um, we gotta think about how cultura then can either hurt us or help us, right? What are some of the ways that our cultura can hurt us? No tengas vergüenza. Don't 
be ashamed. You can say it. What are some? Yes, Carrie. It can perpetuate bad practices or bad behaviors. Okay, so we can perpetuate bad practices and bad behaviors, right? Like I remember my mom when I was a kid, she would tell me, you have to clean up after your brothers. And I'd be like, what? I don't think so. You know, and she'd be, you're the girl, you have to clean up after your brothers. And I'm like, I didn't make that mess. They have to clean up after themselves. Right? And she just never understood why I didn't buy into it. Right? But to me, it was like, I'm not going to clean up my brother's mess. Right? That's their mess. A ver, diga. Okay, so in her family, she grew up, you know, saying that women are supposed to be obedient to the men. Period. That's it. And women belong in the house, right? And do work in the house, right? But she stood up to that and didn't buy into it, right? And um, but so those are some of the ways that cultura can hurt us, right? If you buy into it and you just accept it and you know don't question it or don't challenge it, right? Um, and the other thing that you know I think is real important too um, is that we recognize that we are the creators of cultura. We make cultura. Nosotros. We are the creators every day with everything that we do and how we do it, right? So we make those decisions about how we're going to act and, and how we're going to be. And so we can decide to be different. We have that choice. And I don't think we think about that enough, that we have the right to, to change our cultura, to make it be different, and to benefit us in a much more effective way than what we have up to now. And so, um, when we don't know ourselves, the other thing that happens is that um, we become vulnerable to somebody coming in and telling us who we are and what we're about and what we should believe and what we should like or not like, right? And so it's important for us to do that for ourselves first so that we know what our standards are and who we are and what we're about and not have to, you know, um, just, you know, let everything fall by the wayside when we fall in love and let somebody else make decisions for us. Okay? And so um, that way um, is the easy way. Certainly it's the easy way. But maybe that other person is not going to have our best interest in mind. And that's the thing that we've got to be concerned about, right? And um, uh, sometimes it might feel good for somebody to say, hazte pa acá, mijita, you know, and, and we romanticize that, right? We say, oh, how sweet, look, he wants me to be really close to him, or, or he wants us to spend time together, just me and him, right? When really what they're doing is isolating you, and if you don't know that, you know, ahí caes en la trampa, right? You fall into that trap. And so we really have to be knowledgeable and aware of these things. Otherwise, you know, um, and parents are in a position to teach that to our kids, right? Um, but parents have to be schooled first also. Um, I'm so glad that uh, Heidi also brought up how in Texas, you know, the, the student health advisory councils, what they call the shacks inside the public school systems, those are the entities that are in charge of deciding how much of this you know, prevention and education information gets delivered at the schools. And so for parents that might be interested in talking to somebody at the schools, you have to go through the SHEC, okay, the Student Health Advisory Committees. Um, and they're the ones that um, are responsible for deciding how much uh, this information gets into the curriculums and how often and who gets to deliver it and all of that, okay? Um, and the other thing that we've got to think about too, we live in a community where we have a lot of substance abuse, right? Um, and um, a lot of times when young people get caught up in situations of abuse and violence, one of the ways to escape is through substance abuse. 
And if you have a family where this pattern is already established, then it's even much easier to fall into that trap of coping and numbing yourself and not dealing with your problems by way of substance abuse. And, um, and then you might end up in a situation of abusive violence where uh, your partner will make sure you do drugs or you drink in order for them to be able to control you, dominate you, and do whatever they want with you, right? And so um, that too is part of our community and our cultura that I think makes us vulnerable in San Antonio and Bear County is that we, we, um, we tend to you know, abuse drugs and alcohol a lot here. And uh, to me, that's a, another sign that our community needs a lot of healing uh, because there's a lot of us that are the walking wounded and we need a lot of healing and we need a lot of support and we, um, we need to make sure that we are not embarrassed to seek that help and that healing, that sanación that we so need um, and don't be embarrassed and don't be ashamed and turn to each other for information. Um, so please, if any of you do need to talk to somebody or want some information, don't forget about those index cards and putting them in the little basket up here because we would love to return those phone calls and, and help the community out. So I'm gonna stop there, thank y'all so much, and I'm gonna turn it over to Kimberly. Where they pushed him, or they said all these things, um, 
but they're noticing that it quickly happened again, a fight happened again. Um, and so the hard part is that fight may only last 30 minutes, maybe an hour. They say, I'm sorry. The hard part is that sorry is usually a blame. I'm sorry you got me so upset that I yelled at you. Doesn't sound like an I'm sorry. Um, well, you know, I was having such a bad day, and just the way you were talking to me, again, that's not really an apology, that's all excuses. And that's a big thing that I try to work out with teens all the time is, well, how did you resolve that fight? And I always hear excusing apologies. I don't actually see remorse or genuine apologies, which I really want, or I really try to work with them in recognizing, right? If your boyfriend or girlfriend says, but you were doing this to make me angry and that's why I yelled, no, I want to hear another apology because that one wasn't good, right? You can't blame someone for something as you're apologizing for it. And that's a big thing that I work on with teens is understanding resolutions because arguments happen all the time, right? My name's over here saying no relationship's perfect. And so I do tell teens all the time that even though you're fighting, it does not mean you're in a violent relationship, but it's what that looks like. And so after that fight, it goes, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, we're in a happy place, right? Let's go on a date, I'll make it up to you, let me buy you lunch, and it just keeps going. This cycle keeps going, and denial is a big factor that fuels this cycle. Of it doesn't happen that often, or they didn't really mean it, or you know, I really love them, and so it's really difficult. Outside perspective, you get to see it like a TV show, and you're like, yeah, leave. But when you're in it, there's a reason why we say love is blind. Right? It's really hard. When you really care about someone, you don't, you don't abandon them necessarily. You almost want to fix them. And that's what breaks my heart in the past seven years of doing this. They always just want to fix their partner. They're like, I don't want to leave them because I like them, but I want, to, I want to change this. I don't like this. I don't like that they use me as a punching bag, but I want to be there for them because they're going through a lot at home and I understand what they're going through. And so that's hard too. They're kind of putting themselves last or second right, in that relationship. And a partnership, I always tell them, is equal. If anyone at any point is feeling like once winning fights, which you never win any, right, that's an imbalance of power. And that's when relationships can become abusive. So different forms of dating violence. One that I see a lot and that we don't talk enough about is emotional violence. Because emotional violence is something you don't see, right? Like the black eyes. You see those. You see the scratches. You see the bruises where people ask that's why behind them, you don't want that attention. With verbal abuse, no one sees it, and so we don't have to talk about it, right? They can post on their Instagram or Facebook all the cute, you know, anniversary pictures, but then you don't know when it's just them two, they're getting talked down to. Um, they're getting told, well, who are you gonna be with? How long are you gonna be there for? What are you gonna do afterwards? When are you gonna text me? That's a lot, right? And when I talk about that, a lot of teens are like, yeah, you know, um, I have a partner that may jokingly put me down and embarrass me in front of my friends. And again, they're kind of making those excuses of they're jokingly doing this. But if you really care about someone, are you gonna embarrass them, put them on the spot all the time, you know, make fun of them at their expense all the time? Maybe siblings would agree, but <laughs> in, a, in a partnership, that shouldn't be so. Um, a big thing I see with Verbal abuse is the control of dictating what they wear or who they hang out with. I see that constantly with teens, okay? So I really want parents in the room um, to hear this. If you're hearing your daughter or son talk about like, well, you know, um, I'm gonna go to Steven's house. Oh, okay, we haven't been at, um, you know, um, I can't even think of my name right now, I'm sorry. Sandy's house on the street, how come you haven't hung out with her in a while, right? Like she's come over all the time. Oh, well, you know, now that me and Jack are together, she doesn't really want us hanging out, right? All the time. Jealousy is a big thing in relationships. And because teens are still learning how to do this, their jealousy is telling them, I'm going to isolate you. Even though they're not literally telling them to isolate them, they're so uncomfortable, they don't want to lose their partner so bad that they're telling them, don't hang out with them. I've had plenty of girls tell me that their boyfriend told them that they can't talk to any boys at school. Any boys? I was like, so what do you do when you have like a group project? What? You're just like, 
right? It becomes really ridiculous to where they kind of laugh and like, yeah, man, that does sound ridiculous because that shouldn't be the case. But they're just so insecure about them, them where they are in that relationship that they think that like, I don't want to lose them, so I'm going to hold them super tight, right? And that's something that we get so nervous about. But as we learn through adulthood, adulthood through experience, we realize if we really care about them, we have to let them be them. Right? And that's where trust comes into play. Right? Whenever there's jealousy, I always say, well, there's not trust in that relationship. If there's really that much jealousy, there's not that much trust. Because jealousy is natural. I tell people that all the time. Because they'll be like, this is so crazy, I'm jealous. No, jealousy is totally natural. But how we control our jealousy is really important. Okay? Um, if you see your partner walking with a boy or girl in the hallway, right? That's a big one. Um, they'll get jealous, right? Because you're like, hey, I want to be there talking with my boyfriend or girlfriend. Valid. But how do we deal with that situation? Some of them will like stomp up in the situation and be like, well, who are you? I'm their boyfriend or girlfriend, right? Like, and they try to be really territorial. And I tell them, you're basically like peeing all over them and saying like, my partner can't talk, I talk for them, right? You're not really giving them agency or letting them be their own person. That's not a healthy relationship, okay? Same thing with dictating what they wear. I see that a lot with girls, okay? Um, where their partner will tell them, those pants are too tight on you, I don't like it, right? Or that crop top you're wearing, I don't like it. And when I work with girls, I tell them, ask your partner why, right? Why? Because really what it boils down to is they're insecure that you might leave them from someone else, right? Because my girlfriend looks so good in that crop top, I'm worried that some guy's gonna go ask her out. Okay, but if there's trust, then that random single guy that goes up to your girlfriend and asks her out, she'll be like, no thank you, I have a boyfriend. Simple as that, right? But that's stuff that we really need to learn, and we don't always see from our family, right? That's a big thing. What Patricia was talking about, we learn that from our family. Um, a lot of times in families where the husband may make their wife wear certain clothing, right? Um, or they feel like if they're a good wife, they'll cover up. You know, they won't wear a certain thing. Even though they might, they, they may really want to, right? They may even look really good in this one dress, it's really tight, but then they feel like they're not being a good girlfriend or wife if they're doing this. And this is where a lot of manipulation comes from. And this is the hard part because that's like in our brain and we don't necessarily recognize that. Um, and so verbal emotional abuse is really difficult to see. And so as parents in the room, really talk to your kids all the time about your relationship or their relationship, right? Ask about their girlfriend or boyfriend all the time. You know, how's it going? You know, how did you guys, did you guys fight yesterday? I heard you guys kind of yelling in the bedroom, right? Ask about those things, because that's good. If you're just assuming that everything's okay, your child's gonna get used to like, blurring you out, right? It's really important to keep that open communication. Um, one more thing I want to talk about is gaslighting, and that's something that is maybe a new phrase that we hear, but it's something that's very old. Uh, we blame the other person for what I did. Okay? Um, so maybe I told my partner I was coming home at 9, but I showed up uh, at 11, and I didn't text them, and I was drinking, and they're telling me, you told me you'd be home by 9. I was like, no, I didn't. Right? I'm basically kind of mind playing them to feel crazy. No, I never told you that. Yes, babe, you did. No, when did I tell you that? Even though I know I did, I'm trying to play this game really hard. It's like a good poker player right here. You're trying to play it really hard so that you're like, yeah, yeah, no, you, I swear you told me 9 o'clock. I swear you told me 9 o'clock. No, I never told you 9 o'clock. If I had told you 9 o'clock, then I'd be home at 9 o'clock because I love you and I wouldn't be out late. And that's when relationships, right, when some girls will be like, I feel crazy, gaslighting. Where it is valid what they're feeling, but their partner is making them feel, or basically telling them, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not reality, which is really difficult, okay? Especially with teens that are really emotional, it's like, well, yes, I thought this, but it's really erratic, it's really hard. And that's a new term I feel like that we're using now, but it's still something that's ha been happening for a long time. So, teens in the room, right? You're not crazy. If you're feeling like something was supposed to happen or they said this, stick to it, right? Um, talk through that. Because if you can talk through that, you may catch them in that lie. There's only so long that they can keep that lie up, right? So, physical, 
visible one. I know it's obvious, you know, the hitting, slapping, punching, but I do want to add that it's not just to the person, but it can also be their face, okay? Um, so if they, after a fight, key their car, okay? All these things, it doesn't have to be you hurting them actually directly, it can be their things, their belongings. Or I've had teams before fight, throw their partner's phone against the wall, right? And then like, you may be this angry, don't make it happen again. That's intimidation, right? They didn't actually lay hands on you. And so that's also hard for some teams because they'll be like, no, I'm not in a violent relationship. My partner just has anger issues. Well, that is a violent relationship because they're intimidating you all the time. Um, another thing is cyber abuse. A new thing, right? The parents understand that when we're talking about cyber abuse, checking in all the time when the teen is like going somewhere after school and their partner where they can't stop texting. Okay, so there's some teams that I have that are like, oh miss, we text like 24 seven, right? If we're not texting, then something's wrong because we're always doing that. That's not necessarily healthy. And as a parent, you wanna let them know that, right? I don't talk to your mom or dad sometimes for like eight hours at a time, right? Um, and the reality of that, there has to be trust there. Yeah, maybe I don't talk to mom or dad for like two hours, I'm not freaking out. Right? I know they're at work, or I know they're out getting lunch, or I know they're doing laundry, right? There's trust. And if I am maybe concerned that something else is happening, I talk to them, okay? Because texting is not the best way to communicate, but it is a large way on which we communicate, right? Teens are way more comfortable, I'm way more comfortable texting sometimes, right? And it's really important that we kind of pull away from that, especially if we have conflict, or we want to talk about something serious. Always do that in person. Uh, sexting is something I also see with relationships where um, if we're talking about digital consent, a partner will send maybe a naked picture to their boyfriend or girlfriend and they now have that picture, a very vulnerable picture, and they can sometimes use that against them. Um, I've seen this a lot with waiting to have sex. They'll be like, well, this, I'm not ready to have sex, so I send them these pictures because I do care about them. I really want, I really care about them. I don't want to lose them. So I send them these because I don't mind. Because I'm not comfortable yet having sex. Okay, I get I get where you're coming from. And it's really hard when that partner uses that against them and says, well, if you're willing to send these to me, you're willing to do it. Right? Or they use all these really derogatory names and call them and be like, well, if you send me that picture, you can do this. Or if you don't have sex with me, I'm going to show these pictures to people. It becomes black male, right? That's really hard um, because you care about this person. So you may want to be like, hey, don't do that. But then who do you go to, right? Who do you go to when a teen's getting blackmailed by their boyfriend or girlfriend? That's really difficult because they don't want to tell on them, right? They just want them to stop. And that's what's really hard, um, especially when we're talking about age. Right? If we're under the age of 18 and we're sending an explicit picture, that's considered child pornography, no matter what age of person that has it. And that's a whole other gamut, right? But ways in which we um, teens have told adults at their school or their parents, and we've been able to address this teen having that violent relationship by just looking at the pictures that they're sending, right? And that um, text communication. Um, also, as well as sexual abuse, okay, so with that, um, any kind of pressure, all right, we really want to push consent, asking for things, and not just asking for our sex, literally, but asking, like, I really want to kiss you, right, it does not just have to be with sex, or I really want to take you out on this date at this park, right, consent is about anything. But we also really need to have consent when we're talking about any kind of sexual activities that we're doing, right? And that does not mean that if I'm saying yes to making out, that that means yes to anything in bed. That's not how that works, right? Consent is continuous, because you may love making out with them. And they're now saying, like, okay, well, let's take our clothes off. And you're like, okay, I'm comfortable with that. But now they're wanting to maybe push this further. And you're like, oh, no, I kind of just want to stay with this. Right? And I don't really want to move forward. I like it right here. That's fine. When a partner starts to push that, and they're like, no, 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 let's just keep going, and they don't really care about what you have to say, 
that's when that's no longer fun sexual activity, but now considered rape for sexual assault. Okay? If your partner doesn't want to go further with what you want to do, I'm sorry. But there's always another time. Alright? So like teens in the room. I know you may have an expectation of like what a date could look like afterwards, but if your partner's not comfortable, like if you really want to make out with your partner or let's just say first date person, but that didn't happen, that's okay. Doesn't mean they don't like you. I tell teens that all the time. Just because your girlfriend or boyfriend doesn't want to have sex with you yet, does not mean they don't care about you. We kind of put intimacy on the same level of like, you really care about me, all right? Because it's intimate, it's vulnerable, right? We're doing things that we're not doing with other people. And so a lot of teens will do this to prove their love or affection, right? I love you. Or I'll hear, well, if you really love me, then you would do this with me. Or you would explore this with me. Right? And that's hard because you may love them. And you're like, well, yeah, I love you, but I don't want to have sex yet. It's confusing. It's a mind game, right? Try two 16-year-olds that are really caring about each other. And now one of them is throwing in sex and it's like, well, if you really love me, we would try this. I guess, right? Because with that logic, I guess, right? I, I do love you, but my gut's telling me no. I work with a lot of teens to listen to that gut instinct, okay? Whether it was holding hands or anything more than that, if your gut is kind of like, eh, don't do it, right? And they'll even joke, like, well, this holding hands is fine. Yeah, but if you don't want to do it, you don't have to, right? Even going on a date with a boy or a girl, you don't have to. Okay. Plenty of them feel like they have to. You know, like if this popular boy or girl has come out, they feel like they have to. Um, or as one boys will say, you know, to look like you're dating a lot, I gotta say yes to all these girls. It's like only do what you're comfortable with, right? So let's talk about consent. This is really important. Um, and consent is more than just yes or no. All right, consent is not, even though like, yes, we have consent forms, consent is way more than just yes or no, all right? Consent is something that should be continual. Consent is something that makes you feel comfortable, all right? Consent should be a conversation. I do want to say, though, that a lot of parents ask me, okay, but legally, what is consent? It's like, okay, so I'm going to answer that question. Legally, right, so in Texas, um, you cannot have sex if you're under the age of 17. Okay. Which, when I talk to a lot of parents, they're like, oh. They're shocked. I think I'd like to ask them first, like, oh, how old do you think you need to give consent? And a lot of them will be like, oh, I'm 14, 15. I'm like, okay. I tell them 17, they're like, 17? Okay. Because again, that generational cycle of like, well, I had sex at 15, so that must be fine, right? Like, I'm okay, I'm still here. But at that age, it is really difficult to make a really thought out, comfortable decision. Because there's so many other factors, right? Besides just peer pressure, there's a lot of other factors. Um, when we're talking about sexual activity, it can never be forced. But there's also that tricky one of coercion, right? Where the, well, if you love me, you do this. And that's one of those triggers, is that you can't really see manipulation all the time. On the outside, yeah. Like your friends may see it, or other people may see it, but you, right, in that relationship, are like, no, that's not what this is. It's really hard, because there's so much feelings and emotions attached to this, that you don't want to see it as coercion, or, or manipulation, really. Um, but if your partner's saying, well, if you love me, do this, that's coercion, right? They're kind of trying to make that yes, right? To try to make that, like, no, or like, oh, no, into a yes. And we do not want that. Right, in our culture, right? We're talking a lot about culture, that's really important. As our culture, we always encourage boys to just keep asking until they get a yes. And that's really hurtful for our community. Because when we tell boys, we just keep going until you get a yes, right? Or give a girl enough to drink before they go home with you, really unhealthy messages about sex. Really unhealthy. Because you're basically telling girls, try really hard to say no, Right? And boy, keep going until you get a yes. And so we're basically kind of like pushing until one person gets in. And that's not how this should go. Sex should be two people wanting to do this, talking about, you know, I've been thinking about this, right? Or I'd really like to do this with you. That's a consensual, healthy conversation, right? 
I tell teens all the time, if you're not able to talk to your partner about having sex, you're not ready to have sex, right? No matter how old you are, if you're not ready, if you're just still uncomfortable even talking about it, right? Because you don't need to. I tell teens all the time, you can be in a long-term relationship, right? I've had teens that have dated for two or three years, and they're not having sex. So there's other ways to be intimate or be vulnerable, right? Sharing things about yourself to have that connectivity without, that, without the sexual intimacy. Um, it is not consensual if someone is under the influence, um, as well as unconscious. So when teens are at parties and they've been drinking, even though they shouldn't be, yes, that's happening. It does not mean that they're asking to get raped, right? But then drinking at parties, right, they hopefully will learn, hey, you drink too much, that's not healthy for you, right? Don't do it again, mom will probably ground you. But it's important to know that if someone's been drinking or under the influence, that it is us that is potentially taking advantage of them, okay? I tell adults, if it makes sense, do you know your limit of drinking and driving? Do you know if you have a beer at dinner, can you drive home? If you say yes confidently, like, oh yeah, I can, that's fine. Then you're also able to have maybe a beer and have sex. If you had maybe two margaritas, it's based off you. Can you drive home? Do you feel comfortable driving home? That's also another thing. People are like, yeah, I'm really good drunk. No, 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 right? Like, that's different. <laughs> Should you be? Right? Should you be? No. Because, what is it? Moms Against Drunk Driving has really changed our culture to where now, when I, especially when I go to colleges, they'll be like, no, man, I take their keys. I'm a good friend, right? I take their keys. I know what to do. And I'm like, okay, but what if they've been drinking a lot, but they're not driving, but they're leaving with someone you've never seen before? Oh, I don't know, that's on them, they're gonna hook up, I don't know. Okay. So when it deals with driving, we're pretty good. Teens are pretty good about like taking those keys, right, and making sure that they're safe, but there's that disconnect of going home with them or being intimate with them after drinking. Because our culture kind of encourages drinking with sex, which is so unhealthy, right? Because we want to be able to be sober and enjoy this, right? Sober and being intimate and really knowing what your partner likes or what you like, right? That's really important. Especially if you think your partner has been drinking and you want to get intimate, there's always another time. I tell teens all the time, there's always another time. This is not, yes, I know it's prom, yes, I know mom's out of town. There's always another time. Do not force it. Because you could potentially be taking advantage of your partner, boy or girl. Um, if there's any intellectual or mental disability, okay, so if um, we're talking about um, some 15-year-old that's functioning at a 7-year-old level, right, um, then dating a 15-year-old, they cannot really be intimate in that way because they are functioning at a 7-year-old level to where they're not understanding the choices that they're making, right? Because think about it as if you're 7. You don't really know what that means. Right? And so that other person is very much can easily take advantage of that other person. So the disability community is very much uh, targeted with sexual violence. Um, and then lastly, people that are there to help. So um, public service people, um, so like police officers, firefighters, not allowed, right? Police officers, they pull you over and they ask for a sexual exchange instead of your ticket. That is not allowed. And I know some people have joked about this before. Um, or teen time anyways. And it's really important that we know that yes, police have definitely an authoritative figure to where you don't, you're like, wait, what? They just asked me, right? Almost to where you're like, if I say no, am I gonna get in more trouble, right? Are they gonna pin it on me? Do I say yes? When I met people in the situation, they said, well, I said yes because I didn't think that I had a choice. I didn't think I could say no to this police officer that could potentially make it worse for me. Um, and so those people, right, that are here to death are also not there to have sexual relationships with us, as well as people that are there, like counselors, right, teachers, um, people that are there to educate or help us. We're not supposed to blur those lines. There's supposed to be clear boundaries about, like, no, we cannot have a relationship. Um, or juvenile detention. I worked a lot in juvenile detention, and we had um, a guard, I want to say a year ago, that had a relationship with um, a teen, and it's funny because they always talk about the relationship, and I'm like, why are we not talking about it as abuse, right? A lot of people said, like, well, they had a relationship. 
A 35-year-old and a 16-year-old had a relationship? We need to change that language, right? That was abuse. That was not okay. Even though that 16-year-old was like, yeah, I want to do it. That was a 16-year-old with a 30-something-year-old, right? I don't care if she willingly wanted to do it. That was not okay. That adult had all the power and decision-making in that. Not okay. So we need to make consent an end conversation to where it's not so uncomfortable for us to be like, oh, can I kiss you? But more talking openly with your partner. Like I said before, of if we're kind of uncomfortable, talking about it more actually will make it less uncomfortable. I know that sounds weird, but talking more to your partner and being more vulnerable will actually make you more comfortable when it comes to talking about intimacy. Okay? And that's really important because the whole point is we want to be comfortable with this. Yes, sex is new and you're exploring that, especially when you're young. And so maybe it's not 100% comfortable, but at least on the same page of like where you and your partner are at. Where you're able to ask questions, where you're able to be like, actually, no, I don't like that. Can we go back to this? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, let's go back to this. I like this. Right? I don't have to push you out, have to force you out, to like make you feel like you have to go all the way or whatever that means. Right? Um, and so setting boundaries really important. I know they talk about setting boundaries. When we're talking about setting boundaries, it's basically how do you want people to treat you? And that is so important because we don't talk about boundaries. And when we do, whenever I ask teams, what do you know about boundaries? They're like, oh, yes, it's like a line that you're not supposed to cross. Oh, what's this line? Right? And they're always like, I don't know. But like every high school or middle school I go to, always, they always say the same verbiage, right? There's, there's this line you're not supposed to cross. So we're really not teaching boundaries effectively. Because it's not this line, it's imaginary line. I kind of try to tell them it's like a bubble because I try to do something that they can relate to if they've heard before. And it's like, what makes you feel comfortable? Your best friend hanging all over you, you may feel comfortable about that. Maybe your boyfriend or girlfriend hanging all over you, maybe you don't, right? Because you're like, my mother too close, right? What is it I don't know, right? And that's okay. You may tell your boyfriend or girlfriend, I don't really like it when you kind of hang all over me. And that's what making a boundary is. That's it. You tell that person how you want them to treat you. Because it's not making you feel so good. It does not have to be this big old sit down conversation. It doesn't. You're basically just letting that person know honestly what's going on in here, right? I'm not necessarily feeling that comfortable and I want to let you know. That shows a healthy relationship. If we're nervous to tell our partner about this, there could be abuse or just talking about a big lack of communication in that relationship, all right? I know when we've been going over like what abusive relationships could look like. If your teen right has a boyfriend or girlfriend that dictates what they wear, that does not mean that they're in an abusive relationship, but that could be a factor in it. Okay, so I just want to put that out for parents that may be freaking out. Um, there's a lot, so it's really important that you talk to your child, have this open communication, not just a one-time sit down and how is your relationship going, but ongoing, right? Like if you ask them how school is, they say fine. Okay, cool, let's ask about something maybe they would care about more, right? So, hey, how's um, Sandra, right? Like, how are you two going, right? Are you gonna go hang out on Friday night? Ask about that stuff, that's important. Because sometimes they'll tell you some stuff, and sometimes they won't, so you gotta keep asking, right? That's really important. And also, be really vulnerable with them and talk about your relationship, okay? Um, so as far as what parents can do, some takeaways, talk to them about, like, me and your dad have fights sometimes, right? And it's really frustrating because I want to hit them, but I never do, right? Your kid may be like, what? I expect that, right? Or maybe they hear it. But you being really open about that helps them, wow, mom is talking about something you think kind of awkward. And it kind of opens up this, like, maybe there's not so much more that can happen as far as, like, it being more awkward or more uncomfortable, you know? Um, so as parents, sometimes you want to break the ice and throw something out there that is really vulnerable for you because your child's going to sense that, right? And they may start to kind of give you pieces of their relationship or their life that they may not tell you before, okay? Um, really hone in on the idea of that their body belongs to them at an early age. I know we're talking about teens, but every single child really needs to know that your body's yours, okay? We teach that here in like daycare, right? Like you can't touch them. They didn't say you can't, right? It's really important to do because too often, especially girls, we kind of feel that like, oh, well, if a boy likes you, they're gonna touch you. 
Right. Um, I go to school in high school all the time. And there's, I don't want to curse, but grab ass Fridays and things like that where girls will say like, oh, well, I had two boys do this. Right? It's almost like a status thing. Um, it's really unhealthy because we're basically talking about harassment at schools, which when I tell people at schools, they're like, oh, no, no, that's not harassment. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's sexual harassment at school, right? Um, and you need to do something about that. Um, and that's happening at a lot of high schools and middle schools, so if we have any people that are in the, you know, ISDs, that is a big thing that we really need to be talking about because it's happening across the board, and we're kind of using it. Some of them don't like it, right? As they should. But some of them are using it as like a status, which can be really unhealthy, especially how young they are. Get comfortable talking about sex, okay? Because you want to know if your child's doing this, right? You want to make sure they're comfortable. We have so many teens that become pregnant, or teens that have unsafe sex, right? That takes two teens <laughs> to have sex. And they don't really know this stuff. And we're not really talking to them about it, right? Our sex ed here is like giving boys condoms to save these days and telling girls don't do it. So we get a lot of mixed messages and we get a lot of teen pregnancies. And so we really, parents, this is on you, you need to get more comfortable talking about sex, literally, okay? It is for your child's benefit. It is really important, okay? And I'm not telling you that you have to talk about your own sexual whatever, but talking about sex. Right, using the real names of things, right? Like they're not supposed to touch your vagina or your crotch. Saying those things, right? It's not, that's not bad words, right? Like if you're talking about bad words, you're talking about cursing, right? Saying the word penis isn't a bad word, right? You want to get them to understand those things and it's normal, but also age appropriate, right? Very important. Talking about privacy, okay? With cell phones especially. They shouldn't be giving their passwords out and talking about, you know, undressing, um, especially when we talk about like, middle schoolers and like locker rooms, right? What does that privacy look like? What kind of privacy do you give your child, right? What do you expect back? Very important. Um, use media as examples. I love that the two can mention songs. Yes, right? Teens love music. And if you are the, putting on the radio when you're taking them to school or picking them up from school, if you hear a song, which you will hear tons, that talk about anything violent or derogatory, bring that up, right? And I talk a lot with parents about this. It's one of the easiest ways to connect with them because they know the songs. They're singing the lyrics. The hard part is they're not always connecting the meaning with the lyrics, right? They'll be like, this, I can sing this whole Cardi B song. They'll sing the whole thing, and they'll be like, what does it mean? I don't know, miss, you just hear me singing? Were you not paying attention? Yeah, I was, but what does it mean? That's the disconnect, right? And so as parents, we can be like, dang, what did they just say right now that lyric? Did they just call her a bitch? Wait, did you hear that? What does that mean? I know this is your song, so I know you know the lyrics, right? What does it mean? And having a conversation in that way. Because that's something that they're already connected, they know how to talk about. And it's less personal because it's not talking about them. It's talking about the song, right? Or the TV show. Right? If you're watching a TV show and some girl slaps a guy across the face because they're like, you're being annoying. Do you think that she should have slapped him like that? Those are great openers, they're great conversations that you can be starting because it's not talking about them specifically, it's what they're watching. Right? And that is so important. Because especially on TV, we're seeing a lot more girl violence. Right? And we're kind of chalking it up to, oh, well, what did he do? Like, well, if that was a guy slapping a girl on the TV, you'd all be like, oh, no, that is not okay. But for some reason, when we see girls doing it, we kind of have like a justification for it when we really need to put that to rest, right? Girls can be violent just like boys can, and we don't want to reciprocate it, right? Because sometimes girls will tell me, um, I don't want my boyfriend to beat up on me, so I beat up on them. I want them to know that they can't mess with me. I even had a girl tell me that she stabbed her boyfriend once. So this is a big thing. We don't want to show that, like, girls especially, that if someone's being a bully to you, you just be a bigger one. That's not the right message that we're sending. Okay? We really want to talk about, I feel hurt by this, or I didn't like what you're doing, and I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm going to give you maybe another chance, because plenty of us 
have learned really unhealthy habits from our parents. So yes, we do need to work on it, right? We kind of have to go through that healing journey. But we also need to know, I'm not going to give you 5,000 chances, right? And so I'm going to bring up what you did and what I didn't like, and I want us to work on that. And if that partner's really trying to fix it, then that's a great relationship, actually. I know some parents that will tell me, like, oh, well, I told them to push their, that one time, and I no longer let them date that person because I told them to push them. It's almost like you just kind of drag them away and you're isolating them now instead of letting them learn from that, right? Because that pushing is not acceptable. But you basically just told them, we're not dealing with this. We're running away from this problem. Instead of, this is a meaningful person, a potential boyfriend or girlfriend, right? How are we going to deal with this situation? That's really important for them to kind of see that, right? There's something I don't like, and I need to talk to them about it, right? This is where communication comes. This is really important because communicating easy things, again, are easy, right? Like, how's your day today? You know how much I love you. It's really easy to communicate. Talking about how I didn't like you put your hand on my leg and that made me kind of uncomfortable, even though you are my significant other, is a little uncomfortable to talk about, but that's what we need to communicate. And then lastly, you know as parents here in this room, it is never too late to ask for help, okay? Even if your teen is 12, 18, 20, I don't know, it is never too late to ask for help and get resources, okay? If your child is not damaged, if they've been in a bad relationship, no way, by any means, all right? This is stuff that we can use to learn um, in a way um, and help them heal. If they've been through something traumatic, it's really important to help them heal and not just, well, you're never dating them again and let's go, let's move on, right? Let's just forget about it. Your team may not be able to forget about it.
and not worried about to be uh, dating somebody who's not available to help her out. I mean, not to be feel comfortable, secure, confident, and loved. Uh, I'm worried about that because I see how some parents don't pay any attention and they think it's okay to treat your daughter or your son in that way. And um, Maria Dominica Collins has a book about her daughter. She's a mental man from Channel 41 in Spanish. So she, she wrote a book about her daughter and how she was taken away from her and learned a lot lying to her mom of her situation and then by the time she tried to rescue her it was too late to some way to how she made it. Antonieta saved her daughter. I don't want to be on Antonieta's shoes. I want to be in the safety, walking, healthy relationship with my daughter, something I was looking forward to have. And even if I think I'm safe, I still not secure. I still not confident about I'm a married mother and still wanted to have the question, am I in a safe relationship? Am I going to sleep in a safe pillow and wake up? Am I going to go home and I'm in a meeting right now and wondering, I hope my husband is not upset because I'm here early. Or, or being late because it's dark early. So that's kind of things. As a mother, as a wife, I would like to see if we can work on that to educate more people. And thank you for bringing this, because I was looking forward for something like this a long time ago. But now I'm like this the age, so I was thinking start early, start early with the little boys, because I played with boys and I used the Barbies and I had my mind when I saw this boy playing with the Barbies. He says, you, come in, get in the car. And I'm like, uh, no, why you don't ask her? Can you please come over and have a ride with me and enjoy the view? It's, uh, so I teach that boy. It was not my son, it's a friend. And I realized how the violent was, like a young age. So boys can play with dolls and it's okay because that's how you check how their mental <laughs> behavior with the <laughs> So I, I don't know, I'm checking. So this is kind of over my thing. Your teaching us resiliency and strategy and the science. 
But I think if, you, if we set aside a, a, a platform for storytelling, for um, the actual uh, survivors or the people that are going through it and, and share that, I think that that provides a way for uh, people who are actually going through it to to recognize it for themselves and, and step up to get out of the relationship or to seek uh, uh, resources or to ask or to talk to somebody. Because when you're on the other side and you feel the isolation, you don't know who to talk to about what you're feeling what you're dealing with or how to get out or how to find a safety zone. And so when you hear other people talk about it, it may feel, it may make a person feel like, yeah, a little bit of confidence or a little bit of bravery or encouragement for them to step up and say, I can survive this. I can come out of this. And so that's just what I would like to share. That's a great way to end this evening. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, from the YWCA, for coming to this evening. We really hope this begins the conversation that can lead to healing about teen dating violence. And I want to thank all the presenters who did such a wonderful job, and the staff here really making this evening happen. And Charlotte Ann for, for taping this so that we have this as educational and training material that will be available later. So, Thank you so much for coming, really, really appreciate it.